Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's see if I have a mic on. All right, can you guys hear me out there? There we go, got some mic pickup. If you're in the audience, hopefully you're here for prioritization and economics with Max Dalton. And uh, as always, if you'd like to submit questions for this talk, you can do them in the Bizabo app or online. And the office hours are going to be at 3, uh, 3 p.m. immediately after this. Prioritization research and economics have lots to learn from each other. Max will explore this relationship in his talk. Max is currently working on a book-length guide to prioritization research and key ideas in effective altruism. Before joining the Center for Effective Altruism, Max studied philosophy, politics, and economics at the University of Oxford before pursuing an MSc in economics. His dissertation was on the determinants of technological progress. In his previous research, he estimated the cost-effectiveness of research into neglected tropical diseases. Please join me in welcoming Max to the stage. Hey, um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about the, the relationship between prioritization and economics. Um, and I'm gonna start with um, my slide not transitioning. Yeah, what brings you to the conference? Yes, I'm going to start with the puzzle. <laughs> um, <laughs> now that I've solved the puzzle of how to go on to the next slide. So yeah, cool. um, the puzzle is this. So here are four questions. Um, so first of all, how valuable are different types of animals, <coughs> um, say, relative to humans? Yeah, uh, second, is EA more talent constrained or more funding constrained? Yeah. Third, how should we interpret the findings of an RCT, say a randomized control trial oh, cool. into D1? And fourth, yeah. which um, job should you well, take? Well, I used to work at CA, um, Max was my so manager actually oh, until about a month ago. The question is, uh, what do these questions yeah, actually have in so common? How do, do they relate to each other? Um, so it's I probably kind of obvious um, I like if you've been involved in effective <laughs> altruism for a while that these are <laughs> like the sort of questions that effective altruists ask. Um, but apart from that, it's not really clear what they have in common. So um, for instance, um, some are more abstract than others, and uh, some are very applied. So the last question, which job should I take? If I'm choosing between two jobs, um, which is, which is going to have the highest impact, is just um, very applied to my career, and it's very actionable. Whereas the first question seems much more abstract, um, and uh, it's about like, more general phenomena. Um, second, it's about uh, these questions are asking things of different scales. So question two is asking about uh, the EA community, which is a community of thousands of people um, now kind of influencing billions of dollars. Um, whereas question four is just about my measly old career. Um, so very different scales. And then finally, they're using different methods. Um, so again, the first question, we're probably going to want to use neuroscience. We're probably going to um, want to use philosophy to help answer that question. Um, whereas question three is going to be using much more statistics and development economics. Um, so kind of on closer inspection, although these are called all kind of effective altruist questions, um, there's not that much that's uniting them. So what's going on here? Um, to try and explain this, I'm going to start by talking about um, a concept from economics called constrained optimization. Um, so this sounds kind of abstruse, but it's actually something that you do all of the time. Um, so imagine you're going to a shop, um, and you want tea and biscuits. Um, and you don't want, just want tea and biscuits, you like, want the right ratio of tea and biscuits because you want to be able to uh, dunk appropriately. Um, but you only have 10 pounds, um, so you can't kind of buy an infinite amount of tea and biscuits. You, you, there's this constraint on your action. So what you do when you go to the shop is you use the money, the resources you have, to buy as much tea and biscuit uh, combination as possible, and this is the kind of optimization part. So the constraint is the 10 pounds, and then you're optimizing subjects to that constraint. Um, and so constraint optimization problems are problems like this that have these three parts. Um, there's a thing that you want as much as poss possible as, so in this case, it's tea and biscuits. Um, there's some limited set of things that you have. In this case, it's just money, um, 10 pounds. And you're trying to use what you have to get more of what you want. Um, and we'll discuss this a bit later, but this is a kind of key model of rational behavior. Um, and it, it occurs in... Uh, lots of real world situations. Um, so obviously in the real world I don't just care about tea and biscuits, I also want, I want friendship, I want some time off, I want interesting work, things like this. Um, and uh, luckily I don't just have 10 pounds, I also have um, some time, I have uh, relationships and skills that I can use 
uh, to get more of what I want. Um, and so what I try to do in, in my life and what I think most of us are trying to do is to use our resources to get more of what we want, more of these like complex um, and uh, goods that we're interested in. Um, obviously, we're quite imperfect at this. We're very biased and um, it's easy to make the wrong decision, but that's kind of what we're, we're trying to do a lot of the time. And it's, you can even describe businesses like this. Um, so businesses generally want profit. Um, they have uh, some assets, maybe it's physical assets like factories, but also more intangible assets, uh, patents on certain goods. Um, and then they're, they're trying to use what they have to make more profit. So how does this relate to e economics? Um, well, I think you, that you can view economics as basically the study of constrained optimization problems. Um, so lots of econ economic models are built on profit maximizing firms and utility maximizing individuals. Um, and you can actually build um, relatively sophisticated models of the economy using this. Um, so that's one of the key motivations for using these constrained optimization problems is just that they do a decent but not perfect job of describing uh, what we see in the economy. But a second reason, and one of the reasons why economists are sometimes want to hang on to these models even when there's empirical evidence against them is that um, constrained optimization um, can actually be shown to be quite a rational way of behaving. Um, so there's a field in economics called rational choice theory, um, and based on certain assumptions, you kind of end up with constrained optimization as uh, the rational thing to do. Um, so these, there's this kind of a uh, neat theoretical property as well as the kind of empirical property which make, makes this sort of model an, an appealing thing for economists to use. Um, so you might think that this is, um, all of these problems are a bit easy. So I started off talking about like buying tea and biscuits um, and you think this is an easy problem, I could solve this, probably a five year old with a bit of time could solve this problem. Um, actually I think that the problems are a lot more difficult to solve and also a lot more difficult to study the solutions of. Um, partly because in the real world we care about a lot more than just tea and biscuits and we have um, more different types of resources than just uh, money um, and often those resources are much more intangible. Um, but there's another thing which makes it even more difficult um, which is that often we're um, interacting with other agents who are also trying to optimize um, kind of for whatever they're interested in. So we're, we're interacting with firms that are trying to maximize profit and this can um, complicate things. So a simple example, um, now I'm uh, not just shopping for biscuits, I'm bringing food to a party. Um, and I know there are 10 other people coming to the party, um, and I don't want to buy cake if everyone else has bought cake, because um, that would be a less fun party. If everyone else has bought cake, I want to um, bring some beer or bring some, something else and, uh, so we've got a mix of food. Um, so this is a problem of coordination, um, and this means that I have to like, think more carefully through the steps of uh, when I'm making this decision. And then a, a different example, both in scale and in the kind of um, incentives involved, is global warming, um, where obviously no one wants uh, global warming to happen, um, but each individual nation and individuals themselves are kind of incentivized to, um, they don't want to pay the costs of reducing carbon emissions. Um, so this is another issue where coordination between different actors who are all uh, trying to act rationally can make things more difficult and complicate things. So this is a kind of uh, summary of uh, what I've said about constrained optimization so far, which is that um, constrained optimization problems are, uh, I'm kind of defining as these sorts of problems which, um, where there's something that we, we want more of, um, we have some resources, and then we use those resources to get more of what we want. Um, and then this is complicated by the fact that we often need to coordinate with other agents. So again, I've been talking about economics and constrained optimization. What's this got to do with prioritization? Um, so I think we can think of prioritization research as a form of constrained optimization. Um, so in particular, what we want when we're doing prioritization research and as effective altruists is we want a set of moral goods. We want uh, well-being for people. Perhaps we also want justice. Perhaps we, we can even think of ourselves as wanting duty fulfillment even on this kind of uh, relatively optimizing framework. Um, and then again, we have a bunch of uh, goods that we can use to get more of what we want. Want. We have money, we have time, we have more intangible things like reputation and skills. Um, and then what we do is we, again, use our resources to maximize the good. Um, so this is just another like, framing for effective altruism, really. Um, so looking in more detail at these um, three parts, um, so what we want. 
Um, this is really the study of um, ethics, and um, so we're drawing a lot on, on philosophy here. Um, and this is a very open-ended and difficult question, um, and we've been puzzling over it for thousands of years already. But it is something that we have been work that uh, as a humanity has been putting quite a lot of effort into for quite a long time. So this is relatively well explored, even though there are lots of difficult questions here. So an example of this is how valuable are different types of animals? That's the sort of question we might be asking in this section. Then there's a question of uh, what resources do we have and how should we think about those resources? Um, so uh, an example of this is, um, is EA more talent constrained or more funding constrained? And what's really going on here is we've got a simple model of like two types of resources that we currently have. And we're thinking like, which do we have more of? Um, and this helps us kind of simplify and understand um, better how to optimize. And here, um, so, uh, yeah, there are actually like, fewer questions here. The slide's wrong. Um, so there's, I think there's less research to be done here, but it's still quite underexplored. Um, but then, finally, we come to what I think is a, kind of a big part of the prioritization problem uh, with lots of sub-questions here. Um, at, and also relatively under, underexplored relative to lots of the ethical questions. Um, so this is focused more on the practical questions. If we do this, if we fund this charity, if I go and take this job, what's going to happen? Um, so an example of this is how should we in interpret the randomized control trial? Because the randomized control trial is giving us evidence about what happens when we take a certain action. And then finally, we have a kind of coordination issue. Um, so in this case, it's, uh, we might think uh, if I take job A, then um, someone else will uh, take job B, and if I take job B, someone else will take job A, but I'm not sure how good the people who will place me are in each of these situations, so I've got to think about the kind of knock-on effects for people who will take a certain job if I don't take it. Um, and so it, this becomes a complicated coordination issue, um, and one that we're, we're not really quite sure how to resolve yet. Um, so does this resolve the puzzle? Well. I think it's a bit of a resolution, um, or it's one way of looking at, at, at the problem. So I started with these four questions, um, and you might have noticed that I've just kind of explained how um, we can think of these as, as fitting into um, the four categories that I introduced earlier. So how valuable are different types of animals is a question about what we want, what we're trying to optimize for. And is the talent or funding constrained is a question about the constraints that we face and what resources we currently have. And question three, how should we interpret the findings for an RCT, is about how we can use our resources to get more of what we want. And then finally, there's the complicating factor, uh, coordination, which job should I take, um, where uh, ha getting what I want becomes more complicated because I have to think about the knock-on effects on other people and what they would do if I take certain choices. Um, so yeah, I think this is one possible way of looking at the problem. Uh, uh, kind of splitting up these questions. There are obviously going to be other ways. I chose this way uh, for two reasons. So first, um, as I mentioned before, it fits the standard model of rational behavior. Um, and I think one of, the, um, motivating, one of the things that motivates a lot of people in this movement is um, that they want to take a more rational approach to doing good. Um, so by kind of explicitly using this rational choice framework, we're very explicitly taking this on. Um, but another reason is that by using this framework of constrained optimization is very common in economics. Um, and so this allows us to just import a lot of economic theory to the specific questions. So for instance, there's an entire field of economics which is focused on how we should coordinate with other people, um, how rational actors coordinate, and it's game theory. And so we can just import a lot of the results from game theory, and this can help us to understand, better understand the problems, the new problems that we're facing. And similarly, when we, we talk about um, how to use resources to get what we want. Um, economics has the concept of a production function, which is basically ad addressing just this thing. Um, so I've kind of taken you on a, a quick tour of um, some uh, concept from economics, which is constrained optimization theory. Kind of try to say that this is a central thing, a central part of economics, and try to talk as well a bit about um, how this can help us uh, to better understand the sorts of questions that we ask in prioritization research. Um, so now I want to talk a bit about what this means and why I've bothered um, standing here for 20 minutes talking about it. Um, so I basically have got two sentences and four phrases um, which are kind of summing up what I think this means for effective altruism. 
Um, so first of all, prioritization is very hard. Um, it's much harder than most problems you face, and you're gonna face when you're trying to um, help yourself. It's a really complicated issue. And so in response to this, we need to um, simplify our models and um, try to uh, build simple models that we can build on, but we need to do this in a careful way such that we don't lose important bits of information. Luckily, economics is a subject which is built around, which is um, premised on building simple models of complex phenomena. Um, so it's well suited to this task. But lots of other subjects and lots of, lots of other skill sets are also useful. Um, so yeah, first of all, the contentious claim that prioritization is very hard. Um, so first of all, I kind of started this by uh, talking about um, what it, the kind of constrained optimization problem that each individual faces in their personal life when they're just trying to help themselves. Um, but we have some resources and we're just trying to achieve some things that are good for us. Um, how many of you feel like you've solved that problem in your personal lives? Okay, maybe one person. I know that I, have, I certainly haven't. Um, so I think that um, this is perfectly reasonable. It's a very difficult problem. We shouldn't expect to have solved it in our personal lives, but actually the prioritization problem is even harder. Um, why? Well, I'm pretty sure what I want out of life in a personal sense. Um, I have a reasonable sense of like what is good for me, what makes me happy, um, and the things I'm pursuing. Um, but when I think about morality, I'm a lot more uncertain. There are lots of different theories. Philosophers are, have been discussing this for 2,000 years, and they're still pretty much split three ways. Um, so it looks like that's going to be, even just understanding what we want is going to be a lot more difficult. The um, resources we have, that's actually, I think, pretty comparable to the personal case, um, where we have stuff like money and time and reputation and other resources we can draw on. Um, that's actually pretty similar. Um, but when it, the, uh, the especially difficult part is when we use our resources to maximize the good. So when I go and buy biscuits from uh, the corner shop, I um, can look at a price and I can know how many biscuits I can get for, um, for a pound or whatever. Um, but when we think about um, interventions to help others, um, so GiveWell have been studying um, a particular type of thing that we want to do. So one of the things that seems good for the world is to reduce the number of children dying of malaria. And GiveWell have been studying this for many years now. And I think they would agree that they still really aren't sure what the cost of, is for this intervention. Um, like how much you'd need to pay to actually achieve this thing. Plus, we also have some more biases. So I mentioned that we were biased in, our pers in the personal case, um, but we're perhaps even more biased when it comes to helping others. Um, for instance, we have scope neglect, where we don't care 10 times as much if 10 times more people are suffering. And this is gonna, um, some, our intuitions are sometimes gonna lead, lead us even further astray. Plus, I think the coordination issue is harder. So when we're coordinating as individuals, um, either we're coordinating through a market mechanism and uh, prices are actually a, a very efficient way of communicating there, um, and this means that I can coordinate with um, people through the economy quite efficiently. Or sometimes we're coordinating about what food to bring to a party. And in that case, I can just set up a group chat and say, I'm bringing cake. Does someone else want to bring the beer? Um, it's like relatively simple to do that sort of thing. Um, but in the effective altruist community, we're facing a much more difficult problem. Where we've, there are now thousands of people involved, and there are millions more people who are trying to do good in a variety of ways. And we need to begin to set up mechanisms to coordinate um, with all of those people, and that's a much more difficult problem. Um, so I think all of this adds up to that our prioritization problem is even more difficult than most of the problems we face in our everyday lives. And so. None of us think that we've, we've solved those problems, so I think if, if you think you've solved the prioritization problem, if you think that this is exactly the right intervention, and I'm pretty sure it's better than all of the others, um, then you're probably overconfident. Um, and, but we can still expect to do a bit better than, than other people who aren't even trying to uh, optimize in this kind of general way. Um, so there is still some, some chance that we can have a good shot at this, and we can keep improving. Um, and one, of the, one thing to emphasize is that although we're incredibly uncertain and we, we don't really know uh, what we're doing in this domain, um, we, it's still important that we actually do things, that we actually act on our best guesses. Um, partly because it's, we're never going to reach full knowledge and it's important that we begin to help others now 
um, and partly because um, engaging in, in and trying things out is going to give us more information to help solve the problem. Um, so it's important that we still make decisions and we don't get paralyzed, just as you're not paralyzed in your everyday life, even though you might be a bit uncertain as to what the right thing to do is. Um, but what should we do in, when we're kind of studying this problem and we're trying to find the answer? Well, I think it's such a complex problem that we just we need to simplify. Um, and simpler problem, simplifying things is useful in part because it helps us to understand what's going on. I can understand a bit better what's going on uh, when two people are trying to coordinate with each other than if I started with a case where a thousand people are trying to coordinate with each other. Um, and I can also, if I work out what's going on, it'll be easier for me to explain to another person the two-person case than the thousand-person case. But I think it's important not just to simplify, but to simplify in a careful manner. Um, so what do I mean by this? Well, first of all, to, I think it's really important to keep the important parts of the problem. So for instance, if we're thinking about how to simplify the want part of the constrained optimization problem, we're trying to simplify what are our moral values. Um, then we should think very carefully about where is most of the value coming from in these decisions. Um, so an example of a, an attempt to simplify the want part is uh, Nick Bostrom's uh, ruled injunction to kind of maximize the probability of an OK outcome, uh, which he calls maxipoc. And he's doing this because he thinks that a lot of the value comes from the long-term future. Um, and therefore, that's the important thing that we should be focusing on. And it's OK to abstract a bit away from problems that are less important. Whereas I think economics has done this um, kind of badly, where often econ economists are trying to maximize um, for gross domestic products. And they've kind of simplified that as the thing that we care about. Um, and there are obvious drawbacks to that. Um, where that's kind of coming apart from what we obviously care about. Um, that's a bit of a caricature of economics, but um, it's still a commonly used measure. Um, the second thing that we should be aware of is to remember that we are simplifying. Um, so for instance, I talked a bit earlier about talent constraints. Um, and obviously, um, talent constraints are a simplification. Um, so for instance, uh, yeah, there are diff there's different sorts of talent. Someone who's very um, skilled in research is, uh, has a, would not be able to do a role that uh, someone who's skilled in operations can do, and vice versa. Um, so uh, we need, sometimes we need to be aware that like, these simplifications can uh, bring us apart. And often this comes down to context. If I'm thinking about, OK, in general, does the EA community need more people earning to give or not? then it makes sense to talk of talent constraints versus funding constraints. But if I'm a hiring manager at a particular organization, I probably shouldn't be thinking, is my organization talent constrained? I should probably instead be thinking, do I need more researchers, or do I need more operations people, or do I need people with different skills? Um, yeah, also this talk is a simplification. Um, it's not always going to be the right, uh, the, like, right way of cutting up these uh, questions. In particular, there are some things that I've left out which are commonly studied in economics. So economists often incorporate a time dimension or they incorporate uncertainty. And I think these are also important factors in, um, in the constrained optimization problem we face in prioritization research. Um, but I just thought they weren't the most important and I wanted to keep it simple. Um, so what's the response to this? Um, and how does, like, let's bring economics back in here. Um, we can kind of make economics, I think I'd like to make the case for economics is one of the key subjects that uses simple models um, and that tries to like, um, create quick and dirty uh, versions of, of uh, things that can help us understand the basics of what's going on. Um, so what does this mean? It means that there are some models, as I said earlier, that we can just quickly import. So we can just import a lot of game theory um, to help us think about coordination problems. Um, but there's a second thing, which is studying more economic theory um, and studying more statistics and econometrics can help you to build skills in uh, building simple models. Um, so studying these subjects and understanding what's going on there um, can help you come up with new models uh, which are unlike previous economic models, but which are still useful. Um, so there's a skill development element. Um, but it's not just economics. We not, need other subjects too. Um, so clearly we need philosophy for the ethics part, um, perhaps also for some kind of uh, basic epistemological understanding. Um, but I also think we need to look beyond the, these kind of two traditional effective altruist subjects of philosophy and economics and beyond academia as well. Um, so one way to look at this is, okay, businesses face these 
constrained optimization problems? How did they respond? Well, often businesses are facing such complex environments that although they study economists to help with some questions, um, actually the thing that they need to do is make decisions in a, a, a more intuitive or heuristic way um, and drawing on lots of different sources of data and um, in a slightly less academic way. So I think this sort of thinking is something that we can uh, draw on somewhat to, to help us think through the problem. Um, also, often when you're running a business, say if you're running a chemical company, it's important you have lots of chemists who understand what, what exactly is going on and, and uh, how you produce your product. And similarly, um, a lot of the problems that we're going to be trying to solve, we need specialists in uh, specific cause areas that can help um, bring us uh, up to speed and work out what the most effective interventions are within a cause area. Um, but finally, uh, if you look at some of the biggest company and most successful companies recently, they're often um, things which started off as a couple of people with computers in a garage 15 years ago um, with a kind of weird idea that they thought would change the world. And I think, um, although the, I think that a lot of the potential of effective altruism is in some kind of slightly unusual ideas that we have, um, and it is important to remain open to, to these weird ideas as a source of value, um, new causes which are potentially very neglected but might be important. Um, I think we should do that critically and with a kind of an eye to ways things might go wrong. But I think that it's important to be open in principle to weird ideas. Um, so that's the summary. Um, I've argued for the contentious claim that prioritization is hard. Um, so we need to simplify our understanding of what's going on. Um, economics is useful for this, but we also need to draw on other subjects, um, particularly philosophy, applied subjects, um, and kind of weird, weird and left field ideas. Thanks. Thanks. No.